from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, shall I start with you and your name? Darrell. If you could say your full name, <coughs> if you would, please. Darrell Robertson. Gregory Hicks. Carol Cummings Boris. Robert A. Hicks. Charles R. Hicks. Valera P. Hicks. Barbara Hicks Collins, the oldest daughter of Robert and Valeria Hicks. <coughs> I am uh, uh, Joe Meunier of the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We're in Bogalusa, Bogalusa Louisiana with the Hicks family on Friday the 27th, 2011 uh, to do an oral history interview for the Civil Rights History Project, which is an undertaking of the Library of Congress in partnership and collaboration with the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History. We all want to say thank you very much for welcoming us, and we're very pleased to be here, so thank you all. I know it's an effort to get here, and, and we appreciate it. Um, as, as we've said, we'll just have a conversation about all of this fascinating and, and complex history. Mrs. Hicks, could I ask you just to start if, if you'd like, with um, a word or two about um, your recollections of, of life with your husband and, and children in Bogalusa, maybe <coughs> late 50s, early 60s, just before things really start to heat up. Well, it seemed like things has always been bad with us. Someone asked, uh, why did my husband do all the things that he did? And it's because someone had to do it. And our thing is, why did we wait so long to start? But uh, my husband was a very smart man. And he planned before he would do something. He'd sit down and make a plan. Not like his wife, I'll just jump up and do. <laughs> but uh, Bob, as I call him Bob, was always a planner, a very, very smart man, and a very good provider, husband and father, and someone I love very much. Um, anyone else perhaps like to share a sort of family-focused thought about your dad? Yeah. You know, I thought of my dad as just a wonderful man, and I think for me, the important thing was, to a degree, knowing him before the Civil Rights Movement and then knowing him after I learned the many things that he did. Uh, but for me, one of the interesting things about my dad was that he was a black man who had time for his family. Uh, and in a situation in this country where so often uh, many blacks grow up without a father, uh, we grew up in a, in a family where we had a dad, a father who was there all the time, and we were in a family where things happened and we did it as a family. Sometimes I, I think about how lucky we were because in many situations, if you're black and you're a black male, you're lucky if you have a, a father. But in many situations, uh, when there is a father in the house, uh, black daughters have a daddy and a father. And what I mean by that is that a father is somebody who makes you behave and disciplines you and do all that. And he does that for all his children. But then a, usually a father takes time and he's a daddy to the, to the girls. And you will hear women say all the time, my daddy. And black boys don't usually get a daddy. But a daddy is somebody who takes you fishing. Uh, when you're growing up, he, could, he would come home and we, he'd put us on his back and he'd buck and we play horses and just do all these wonderful things. And it only didn't just happen when we were children. You know, he was a daddy throughout my entire life in terms of being there. Uh, you know, he was a daddy that when I was uh, 23 years old and had gone to the DC, uh, to the Democratic Convention uh, in Chicago and the riots were going on and they, my parents were worried about me. And when, I, when they picked me up, I was full of tear gas and the first thing my daddy did was hug me and kiss me. And so for me, I was lucky enough not only to have a father, but I had a daddy as a black man. And so that just shows you kind of exceptional man he was. And I think <coughs> the part of that was that not only was he that for me, 
but for so many people in our community, uh, he was that. So many boys and girls in the community. And I know my brothers and sisters have other comments also, so I'm going to cut right there. Rob? I don't have too much comments. <coughs> Anybody want to maybe suggest some thoughts about um, your recollections of, of Bogalusa just <coughs> as young people coming up just before um, just before the, the protest and movement momentum really began to gather the nature of being a young person here in, in Bogalusa. I can remember of an incident when we wanted to go to the movie and we always had to go upstairs. We could never sit down. I said, I don't want to sit down here. So I did talk to Bob about it and Jack. And we talked about it and that was, you know, before we started the movement. And then he said, one day you will be able to sit anywhere you want to sit. And you know, that kind of stuck in my mind. So during the time during the movement then you know I remember that Derek oh. well <clears throat> the I guess the, the memories of, of the younger days was the hands-on things he taught taught me because I was always interested in changing the oil and he's building on this and he's fixing this and you know didn't didn't have the I guess the resources to pay somebody to do it so it was always <coughs> like okay we can we can take this challenge on let's let's see let's let's tear it apart we had uh, what the Volkswagens back in the <laughs> days that you know you had to they the old, old Beatles just were Beatles, and they would get you down the street and stop. So you had to take your knife out and reset the points, uh, or take a plug out and clean it. And that's where I learned how to do a lot of mechanicing and a lot of, like Greg, a lot of carpenter work, because the old house, basically, we you know all of us kind of pitched in and we built it. You know, he when he got off at two o'clock, he eat or whatever, and we get in the truck and we come down here and we put up five or six sheets of paneling and do molding and to dark and then he he say, okay, let's go, and then just all I guess all the things that he taught me, I still pass on to my son, try to teach him to, to that. It's a lot of things that, just simple things that it looks complicated that if you really step back from it and look at it, it's really simple. You know, okay, good. Come on. Well, I, I guess I realize this is all about, about Pop Bob uh, because of the things that he accomplished, things that he did uh, in his lifetime. But when I remember and go back uh, to the early days, it has always been, as Charles said, I like the way Charles uh, started off with some of the things he said, because it's always been by family, by mom and, and, and dad. Uh, they've always been here, and we got, I got very far in memory. Uh, me and Daryl was uh, two of the youngest. So uh, when I think about the beginning, I think about the fun and the happiness we had. We had a good, we had a happy family. Uh, probably didn't realize some of the issues and some of the uh, complexity of uh, that was going on in Bogalusa and outside of Bogalusa at the time because mom and dad did such a great job of keeping us happy here. Mm -hmm. But when I think about it, when I, now that I'm older and I, I have a time to reflect back and think about it, I think of, of, of dad in, in stages. That's when I was young and, and growing up. And uh, the things we did, uh, as Charles said and Dara said, he taught us things, he taught us value. And then uh, civil rights movement, I, I could think about the things that he did during those times. But the most amazing thing about about this family is, is not what I experienced growing up as a young kid or, 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 or a young child or a young adult, but as I became an older man 
and I listen to people say to talk about the things that mom and dad, that dad had done that we we never even heard of before. Things that uh that he did, things that ways he helped people, uh, some of the 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 strong beliefs he had in in, in people. Uh, it, it's, it was amazing because I hadn't heard those things before, and it's and it's still not completely shocking because you you have to know the man. He he, he was always a good man, and. Uh, some of the things that people reveal, uh, say at his funeral and time after that, they come up and talk about, it, made you realize that, that you, you weren't wrong in your, your conception of him. He was a very good man because of the, the things that people testify that he does. And, and that's the way I remember Pop. I got, I got Pop, right, I remember Pop in stages. And my belief in, <coughs> in really strong belief in, in, in the way he was came really after his death. And, and, Things from uh, revealed to me. Let's pause for just a sec because somebody's at the door. Okay, we're back on after a short break and a little reconfiguration, <laughs> um, which will be a little more comfortable. But yeah, that's great. Um, I think some folks had thoughts that they were. Yeah, did Barbara want to Bob, say, oh, say um, um, uh, I'm the emotional one of the group. Um, and my father only passed a year and a month or so, and so it's a it's kind of emotional thing for me. Um, but I think I think we had a special kind of communication. Um, we communicated with our eyes. We communicated from our hearts. I knew exactly um, what my daddy was all about, and he knew what I was all about. At least that's what I thought until he passed. And then I realized when he passed that he was a giant, and I lived with a giant, and I didn't know it. And uh, everything, everything that I thought a man should be or to stand for. That was my dad. All the time in everything, in everything that he did. So, um, just a little hard, just a little hard. Uh, now he wasn't as emotional as I am. You know, I got a lot of things from him, but uh, I didn't get that from him. But. Uh, very strong. He was really, truly my daddy and a man. Yeah. Rob, did you want to say something there? Yeah. Well, I learned a lot of things from my father. One of the main things is he always said, I always have a plan, always, and he told me, and he was, he had a lot of honest values, he say, don't do that to that person if you don't expect them to do it, he say, always, he taught me about a lot of values, how to be honest and trustworthy and all that, most important, so, you know, those are some of the things that I picked up on and that I live with. I have one more thing I would like to say also, <clears throat> that uh, I really, I, I like the way he expressed himself to the family, and then after I had children, then my children learned to respect him, and they said, oh, I have a problem, oh, let's call Uncle Bob and see what he would say. And he passed the values that he gave to us on to our children, and uh, he just, always made when people walked in the house if it's the first time you came in here you always felt welcome and i think that just spread it all through it so when you know someone come in my house I always said you have to make them feel welcome and you can never do too much for your guests that's in your home and i i just thank him for all, so many when i think about the value so many values and things he taught us and 
sharing he shared all this with our children which was great you were talking about black life uh, and for me what I can remember about black life in Bogalusa as a child and actually I guess almost up until I graduated was that we lived in two separate worlds and maybe part of it was we didn't know how bad off things were because we were children and uh, we had what we had. We had our schools, we had our proms, we had our football games, we had all, of, all our things. Uh, we had movies. I mean, they were segregated, but the movies that the whites saw, we saw too. They were downstairs and we were upstairs. Um, we went uh, shopping. Uh, we, we had places to we shop. And some of the things that I sometimes try to remember back to is like, I don't know when we could try on shoes uh, in Bogalusa, but I remember at one point, I think that we cut, oh, Barbara and I was talking about this, they took a piece of paper and cut it around and we got shoes. But then at some point, I remember that I could just go into a to the store and put on a pair of shoes. I don't know when that transition happened, but you know, uh, black life in Bogalusa, uh, when I think about working situations and I can reflect on a working situation for my parents and other black people, there were different kinds of jobs. Uh, and there was domestic work, um, there was factory work, uh, and there was just young people work where people mowed yards and did those kinds of things. And so uh, for us, black life in, in Bogalusa as a child didn't seem bad. Uh, and we knew that there was a, a, rela a distant relationship between blacks and whites. And uh, we were one of the families that had a car. Uh, sometimes if we uh, were in a car and white kids would go, we go back, <laughs> you know? I mean, this was those kinds of things. I mean, this was part of, you know, and if they came into our neighborhood straight to Florida, they were in for a whipping. And we knew there were certain areas that were for whites but that were white that if we got over there, that we, we could be in trouble. Uh, so in terms of looking at black life, I think we had a why. Uh, we learned to swim. Uh, you know, we didn't have to swim in the creek. Uh, we had activities. We had a school system. Now, it, it, with the school system, for example, we oftentimes got the books from the white school. We got secondhand books. Uh, and sometimes, because white kids know that their books are going, when they got old, they were going to go to the black school, they carve in nigger <laughs> or something. You see that in a book, in a textbook. Uh, sometimes we didn't have, everybody didn't get a book in class. We had to share books. Uh, but we had good teachers, and we had teachers who took exceptional pride in making sure that we learned. And uh, when things didn't go well, or you had a problem, and that was a time when, in black life when every teacher had to visit, basically, uh, those, uh, each child's parent to tell them what, what he was doing in school, what he was, and it, it had to happen more than one time. Now for us, black life was that we were poor, but one of the things that my mother used to do was that my mother used to, uh, my mother could bake, and so she would make cookies for all of us in our classes. And if you were in a his kid class, you were guaranteed to get cookies three times a year. Uh, uh, around Christmas, uh, for Easter, and some other time. And she, her oatmeal cookies were just, oh. And even today, uh, my mother makes oatmeal cookies and send it to uh, my, her, her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren. There's a funny story about, about the oatmeal cookies uh, <laughs> <laughs> right now that some people, with, one of my brothers was to give to my other brother, and somehow his family got them and my other brother didn't get them. <laughs> right, Greg and Darrell? <laughs> but I, and, and so we became, to a degree, black life for us had some special privileges, though we were poor, and we didn't always understand what poor was and what poor meant because there were families all around us. Some families had more kids than we did, and some families uh, had more than that family. But we all uh, ate, out, ate out of each other's kitchen. We all ate beans. We all ate rice. You know, those kind of things. So while black life was certainly segregated for us as children, 
well, we thought we had it going on. And then to mm -hmm. a degree, we, uh, we, those of us who we went off to college or we went to, uh, we joined service and life up until maybe I got into 11th grade, uh, <coughs> things seemed to be pretty good. Let me see, it was um, when, uh, when we were growing up, it was understood that if you saw a sign that said white, and color. It was understood that you didn't go and drink from the water fountain that had white. It was just, un certain things were just understood. Now if you look really deep in that to know how all of that build up that we understood that, that's the same way you can look deep into my dad and to know that whatever the problem was, we had that feeling as strong as we had it about race and uh, injustice, we had that feeling that daddy was gonna take care of it. And that's the only way I can explain it like that. Um, sometimes in high school, or 11th grade, 10 or whatever, um, I was queen of the school uh, I was at an all-black school. I was queen of the school, and I think all the queens of the school get an invitation uh, from Rex down in New Orleans for the Mardi Gras Ball. And I got that invitation, and I was, <coughs> oh, I just knew that I would be going to the Rex. We had, uh, I didn't know anything. I mean, I didn't know. I just said, oh, because you're queen, like everybody else, you get to go to Rex. Uh, talked with one of the teachers from New Orleans, and she said, mm -mm. no, I don't think so. Uh, so we waited for Dad to come home, and we showed it to him. The look in his eyes, he knew it was a mistake, and he knew what was gonna happen to me if I tried to go a black queen tried to go to Rex during that time. And uh, I remember that. Um, so a lot of people say, go, you have the invitation, just go, go to it. And I think it was more trying to think about protecting me, what would happen. And uh, I was finally advised uh, to make a call and let them know that I was black and uh, and uh, oh, I called to tell them how many people will be coming. And oh, by the way, I'm black. <laughs> and uh, it didn't take long that they called and said that was a mistake. Um, I changed that look in my father's eye when 35, 40 years later, uh, I got an invitation from Rex to come to um, the Rex uh, um, no. ball and it gave me so much pleasure to be able to present that to my dad to show him um, that everything that he had done and so many other people in Bogalusa for me that it took that long and once again I'm emotional you know so I'm trying to hold up here <laughs> but it took that long for it to happen, and that meant a lot to me, and it meant a lot to see the the, the expression on my father's face. Uh, and I went to that ball. I think it was a uh, one other black person there. That was my husband, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but we went, mm -hmm. and I just want to share that. Story. You know, some sometime when <coughs> when you listen to people talk, and even your family. They say things and it, it makes you remember something. When uh, Charles was giving his perspective about the uh, the difference between black and white back back uh, well, back in the fifties or uh, early sixties, it made me think about something that me and my mom did just the other day. When we was growing up, I guess we were protected so well from a lot of things. Uh, we had a happy, happy, at least I know I had a happy childhood. And uh, one of the things that happened the other day, me and mom was riding in the car. When we was younger, we went to the neighborhoods on this side of town, on our side of town. 
and we'll go for what we call cross town to Papa Quarter because that's where my grandmother had a uh, stay. But I never went to areas like like Pleasant Hill. I never even really knew they exist. And it, and I, I bring this up because the other day, maybe last week, me and mom, mom was riding in the car and I said, told mom, we was over in Pleasant Hill. I said, I've never been on the street before. But that was a whole different area to, to us. I never knew anything that that area mm -hmm. even existed in Boca Lusa began until I became a man. Mm -hmm. Even during the Civil Rights Movement, I still was, was unaware of, of, of Pleasant Hill <coughs> other than the fact that my grandmother or maybe well, somebody worked for for people over there. Mama used to work in Pleasant Hill. Yeah. Who did? Uh, our great aunt, uh, who lived to be 106, uh, who was just the sweetest person you could ever imagine. But you know, when you were talking about that, I was thinking about uh, Bogalusa and Poplar Quarters. Mm -hmm. And when we grew up, there was another section of Bogalusa. We lived on the south side here. And then there was the north side, which they called Poplar Quarters. And basically, those two black communities were separate until high school. Mm -hmm. uh, that we didn't have anything to do <coughs> with people on uh, on the north side, the black kids over there. They had their own elementary school, mm -hmm. they had their own junior high school. Uh, I don't know if there ever was a, I mean, a high school in Papa Quarter? Mm -hmm. No. Okay, Have and so, yeah. yeah. So at that point you merged. So all the children, we didn't know anybody pretty much, and that was mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you just didn't go to Papa Quarters. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. one, and also I think, and they probably thought the same thing, but we thought we lived on the better side of town <laughs> because we were on the south side. And I'm sure that those who grew up in Poplar Quarter thought they lived on the better side of town. Uh, and that, so there was, even in, in black life, there was two separate communities. Now, of course, on both of those sides, there were different neighborhoods in there. But, but that's a, just an interesting piece that I was thinking about, that black life in and, and they, we had the movie theaters and all that sort of stuff, and they would have to come over. And even if you went to the movies, you know, uh, blacks from the South set in section, I guess, the, I don't really remember, but I'm sure that the kids from Papa Quarter sat together. And there weren't any physical fights as such. There might be confrontation every once in a while. But that was just part of black life, that black life was separate <coughs> to a degree in terms of our growing up. Now, when we got to high school, we saw it come together and be one. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hicks, I wonder how you thought your way through with your husband the whole question of taking that big, big step forward come 64, 65, and really becoming, <coughs> playing the roles, taking, taking up the roles that you and your husband took up in, in that time. Well, after we got involved in the in the movement, thanks to Barbara and some of her friends, they they emptied the schools because two little black girls went and sat at the Woolworth counter when they signed that that bill, and they thought that they could go and and sit there and eat. They put them out, they wouldn't serve them, and that night the Klansmen formed. And when the, the whole Columbia Road, I don't know if you've seen, cause it was just covered with big, white, brawly men. And uh, it, it, it was just something, and then after a couple of days, they decided they was going to come down, you know. The uh, Bogle supposedly decided to get Core in here. And Core uh, came in. My husband, uh, Gail Jenkins, Fletcher Anderson, I think it was about seven or eight men, and Gail went down and they talked to Cora and they got Cora to come in. When Cora came in, they started telling us about how things would be, how people uh, would try to hurt us if we sit at those counters. 
we had to we had to uh, test those accommodations, and they were taking out all the coffee or anything hot. Yeah. They showed the children how they would knock them down. They showed the children how to get in a ball, hold their head, and just let them hit their backs. Uh, they did a, a beautiful job of of uh, preparing us, and uh, after all this happened, they did a. Uh, Barbara and some of her classmates decided uh, they wanted to march. And uh, we as adults, you know, knew the danger, so we kind of stepped back. They went to the school. They pulled every child out of the high school. They went to the uh, junior high. Elementary. Elementary. Mm -hmm. They pulled all those children out. And when we looked around, they had a march of their own coming down Columbia Road. And uh, even even Bob and AZ couldn't stop them. They was just tired of being pushed around and not having the opportunities other people had. So that's how we really got involved in the movement. After the day of testing, uh, Mom, let me say this: what what we uh, students and the passing of the of the Civil, Civil Rights, Rights Act, mm -hmm. Act mm -hmm. what we and what those two black girls understood, and what we could not understand, is that it was the law. It was the law. So if it was the law. Why did we have to wait for like Daddy and AZ and the leaders to tell us, oh, we're gonna, you know, manipulate this with uh, this day and that day, and then we'll have people coming with the training? It was like, no, it's the law. We're not gonna listen. Let's go. And so we went, and we tried to bring everybody with us, but. Uh, we soon understood that um, it was the law, but there were certain things that you have to do. You have to plan, and we uh, we just thought we could do, which which really we should have been able to. Uh, um, there shouldn't have been any planning or whatever. We should have been able to go and get whatever we want because it was the law. And that's what we kept telling Daddy and AZ. It's the law. We can go when we want to. They already passed it. And that's how that's how we thought. <clears throat> I read in the published accounts about the, that Woolworth sit in that that those two girls just sort of went and did it. Yeah. Is yeah. That, is that how you did we uh, found the names knew that of those story? girls? Yeah. yeah, but they would never release Mama. Oh, okay. They would never release the clans. <laughs> That's why they, they. That's why you had so many clans on Columbia Road, because they were uh, they were organizing because they were trying to go out and find out exactly who those girls right. were. Intimidate. And of course, uh, no, they weren't going to intimidate. No. That was going to be over. Uh, the probably the parents uh, also, and uh, they. We were able to get them out of town, and that was that was the end of that. Um, and so it was over. I'm sorry. Could you call out their names now? Do you think would be appropriate? Or? No. 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 Okay. No, um, sometimes they say uh, about the South uh, that uh, you remember and you don't forgive. And so I think if they knew who those girls were, even now, uh, even now so uh, their families uh, and their lives. There would be some reaction. Uh, racism has, has not died in the South or in America. It's still alive and well. Yeah. Barbara, you're making me think, obviously, that one thing that distinguished Bogalusa in its extreme character, it was, very, it was not uncommon in many, many, many places, but its extreme character was the nature of the local police and their close relationship with the Klan and um, hostility to any kind of racial social change. So. I'm wondering if you happen to remember anything that would kind of paint a picture of the police authorities in town back in those days and what you were up against. 
You know, uh, after the after we did that one day of testing, we went through all the legal things, the mail and all that stuff, and they were supposed to give us protection, and they didn't. The children just, it was just something. But anyway, it was over. And uh, we all met at the labor union hall, and the policeman came in, okay, okay, it's over. Y'all can go home. The car workers had uh, two white car workers, Bill Yates and Steve, Steve Miller. Miller. Steve Miller was my baby. <laughs> they came, uh, Bob took them, took them home <coughs> with us. And uh, Bob and, and uh, Bill Yates was going to have a drink, they, you know, and eat and have a drink and relax. Policemen came down to the house, want us to put them out. Put them out. They'll escort them out of town. And that mother instinct came out in me. Steve was young. I said, this is some mother's child and they're going to do them just like they did those kids in uh, Philadelphia. They're not, they're not going to put them. I said, Bob, don't, don't let them take them. He told them, said, this is my home, and these are my guests, and they're not leaving until they get ready. They are my guests, and I'm not putting them out because of you. But you see, that mother instinct in me, got Bob in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he he uh, had to stand up. And then after that, Bob said, we've gone too far to back, to turn around. He started filing suits. I'm sure uh, Dick Sober told you all the different suits he filed. And then everybody wants to know why did Bob do it? Bob had five children. And why, why, why did he take that on? On, up on himself, but we had good lawyers, and they they back backed us up, and uh, Bob Bob filed a suit, and he didn't lose his job, but uh, he had to stand up, and he had to take a lot of abuse. Men had to carry him to work to keep the Klansmen from doing anything. You know, they say you kill the head, you you got the glue. They took him to work, they picked him up, they brought him back. Everywhere he go, he had to have someone with him. Protect him. To protect him. So really, I was the one with this mother instinct that really got him in trouble because if he could very well let them take them and I don't know what they would have done to him. We've talked to Bill Yates recently after Bob passed and Bill said that Bob saved his life. Save his life. I think that one of the good examples of police protection in Bogalusa was you can look at films and look at uh, and whenever we march, uh, they allow uh, the hecklers uh, to throw things at us, yeah. to spit on us. I mean, yeah. not only was there a verbal attack, but there was a physical attack, and it was not one time. Uh, it was a continuous mm -hmm. attack uh, on on black mar on the marches, both black and white. As a matter of fact, uh, if if there were white marchers in the march, they became more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, they were after them more than they were after the blacks. But the example of police protection was that they did nothing. You know, they just stood there and watched us be assaulted or, or be attacked. Uh, it got so bad until the Bogalusa Voters League filed suit. I went into court, and there was a court order. They had to <coughs> order the pro police, and the judge threatened to lock, have them uh, locked up if they did not protect us. Uh, so that's the extreme in terms of how uh, the Bogalusa uh, police were at that time. In many cities, in many places, when you were being attacked, you saw the police doing that, keeping the crowd back. But you saw the police in Bogalusa step by, so you, they could they could make their way through. I think that's an example 
uh, and can be documented by simply looking at some of the films uh, on the many marches. And there were many marches uh, on a regular basis in Bogalusa, and that that pattern did not change. And so we had uh, the Bogalusa Bolus League had to go into court to get an injunction uh, to force the Bogalusa Police Department to do what they were supposed to do under the Constitution of the United States. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things, uh, what my mom was referring to on the day of the testing and when the po uh, chief of police came to the house um, and tried to get the civil rights workers out, when he came to the house and asked that we, um, that, you know, mom and dad, you know, put the people out. And uh, when Bill Yates asked, uh, uh, Ms. Hicks, can I stay in your house? Jackie or so, can I stay in your house? And she said, yes, you're a guest. And daddy said, these are guests in my house and I would not put a guest out. Well, of course, the chief of police was very upset that daddy spoke with him and wouldn't do that, what he was asking him to do. But daddy asked, will you protect my family? And the chief of police said, uh, he had 27,000 people in Bogalusa and that uh, he didn't have time that to- That he liked. That he liked. And he didn't have time to play nursemaid or babysit, uh, babysit uh, people that he didn't <coughs> like. And that it was a mob that was coming down and that they were going to take uh, Bill and Steve, Steve and Bill, and, uh, and the family. So when that happened, um, Mama was trying to get the children out. Uh, Steve Miller went to call his mom. It's like, it's like I see everything happening all over again. Uh, he went to call his mom to tell his mom what was gonna what was getting ready to happen to him. Um, mama talked to him and said that they were gonna let him stay in the house and do everything to protect him. Bill Yates got on the phone and started calling New Orleans, the headquarters, FBI whoever he could think of. I had a list that we normally keep on the wall. I took the list and I went next door to my great aunt's house and we started making calls uh, that they were gonna come and burn our house down and kill us and uh, come with your gun and come and help. So they start coming and also they start calling other people to come. So after we had called everybody on that list, we came back over to the house. By that time, Mama had called, Mama called a friend and asked her to come and pick us up, the children up, to get us out of the house. Now she would stay there with Daddy. She wasn't gonna leave Daddy, but she wanted us to get out of the house. So they came through the back and uh, and uh, the husband and the wife, the husband went in, brought some guns, and we, mama got clothes for us and we got in the car. But we had to get on the floor of the car. <laughs> because uh, the police was still coming around and uh, she didn't want us to, she didn't want anybody to know where we were going. So they slipped us out with us laying on the back of the floor and uh, said, no, you couldn't, uh, we couldn't call because the way that uh, the telephone systems were, they would find out where we were. So we rode all the way down on the floor till we got there and uh, we never knew what happened at that time. Uh, what happened to mom and daddy, uh, we just didn't know, we couldn't call. Uh, that's the way it was. That's how the police were. Uh, 
Well, you know the uh, police, part of the police force were Klansmen. And uh, one young man had gotten arrested because they they would just arrest you, beat, beat you up and arrest you for anything. And while he was in jail, the Klansman came in and he was so afraid. And when he looked down, he saw the police uniform from under the Klansman robe. And uh, as I said, we had to test every facility. We test the, the park. I'd lived in Bogalusa all my life. I hadn't, hadn't ever been in that Cassidy Park over there. And while we were over there, the policeman allowed the whites to come in and jump us. And uh, one old man had a gun. They took his gun from him and they took his billy, that billy clubs and put them between his leg and juggled him up. The man was Oh, he had to be, what, 68, 70, old man. And the policeman had that dog, and they allowed that dog to bite Gregory. We couldn't get any medical help here in Bogalusa. We had to carry him all the way to, to New Orleans. We came to a VA hospital in New Orleans. That's how, how, how we got help. And, uh, they, we had uh, uh, the Jenkins grandmother that, that I'm sure y'all uh, uh, will uh, talk to. She was very, very fair. And uh, they, they started beating her because they thought she was white. And Bob went over and uh, filed them off of her. And uh, she lost the keys to her car. And he. Uh, pushed her car out of the park. But they, they allowed those people to come down and, and jump us. And uh, that's one time when when uh, when they allowed that dog to bite Gregory on his leg. Bob stood up and told that man, you have let that dog bite my boy. He said, I am going to kill you. Cause she let him attack my boy. That policeman got his little gun and his thing. He left that part. Bob was furious. Cause you know, to let to allow a dog and Greg was very small in stature, very small, and he allowed that allowed that big police dog to bite that child on the leg. It was just horrible. We. We slept in our clothes. We didn't. We didn't take our clothes off at night. We were, it was because the Klansmen were all around until the men in Bogalusa decide to do something about it, and that's where your deacons come in. Those Pause are, just one second. I'm so sorry, but. Okay. Yeah, please. Please, John's brought us back on. We'll, we'll stop. No, just tell it. Uh, we, Bernadine, why, where y'all were supposed to go with the hammer? Today. Her father was a, a very old man, and uh, but he was wise. When, when those uh, girls sat at that, at that counter. He said, then we're going to have trouble here in Bogalus. That list Barbara talked about, every, they made out a list and people, like different people had that list taped on that refrigerator. Whenever a problem started, somebody was supposed to start going down that list. And uh, this was from the wisdom of uh, Bertrand Wright. He knew we was going to have trouble and he knew what we was gonna have to do to get help. He knew the policemen weren't gonna protect us. But when when they saw that all those men were coming in down to our house with those guns, then they knew that they were about to have trouble. So what the policemen did, they stopped them. Anybody coming down that way, they stopped them. They wouldn't let them come down that way. But living in Bogalusa, 
the men knew back ways and they came through the back and came through other people's yards and got to our house that way. We had people on top of the roof, we had people in the trees, and uh, we, we had our own protection. And th those men stood up, they, they protected us. This protected us. And you were saying that this was the first time a group of black men um, responded this way? Or? You know, I, I guess you don't know too much about black men. Usually black men will let white people just do them any kind of way and they'll just scratch their head and say yes sir. In the past. But these men decided enough was enough. We were just tired of being pushed pushed around and uh, we decided to fight and my husband really believed in the law. He going to the big courts, not not the people here. He filed a suit, uh, Hicks versus Clas Claxton uh, Police, Bogalusa Police Department. Claxton. He filed that suit and uh, he began, he, his word was we'll go across the lake because that's where our lawyers were. And those lawyers fought, and they filed suits, and we we stayed at the at the court so much down there. Every time you look up, we were headed to those courts down there. And the judge even questioned uh, Gregory because once they integrated the school, it was fights over there. Those those children having problems. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't switch cards. Okay, we're back. See, the children weren't like us. We we always hesitated and stepped back. But those children had uh, backup. They had their parents. And uh, when we uh, got to court at one time, Judge Hebe questioned Gregory. And he asked Gregory uh, how old he was, what was his name, and all this and asked him whether he'd go to school. He went to school at Bogalusa High School. And uh, how many blacks was there, Gregor? Wasn't that many. First year, it was, I think it was two or three. And then we went to, I went to second year, four. Okay. And the second year, uh, I think it was me and Teresa that, that went in the second year. So it wasn't, that, it wasn't that very many, maybe six or seven total. Uh, and then the year after that, my senior year, I think that's when I preliminary most of those guys came. When did Peter come? She came with Belinda. Well, it, it, anyway, he questioned Gregory, he said, and Greg told him his name and <laughs> where he went to school. And uh, he said, uh, so you're the leader of the group over there, huh, Gregory? And Greg said, I beg your pardon? He said, you're the leader of the group over there, huh? He said, oh, no, sir, I'm a student at Bogusa High. <laughs> and, and Judge Eby didn't know what to say about it. <laughs> he said, no, sir, I'm a student. <laughs> but the, the children had to fight, and at one time they wanted to make the black children stay up under the step. And some of the stuff we didn't even know about. We were thinking the children going to school and they got the children in the office and up under the steps and we didn't even know about all this stuff until Gregory came home one day and he mentioned that they wanted them to stay under the steps. And he said, I wouldn't stay on the steps. I hadn't done anything wrong. He said, Mom, if I, if I go under the steps, if I stay on the steps now, I'll be on the steps for the rest of my life. We are not staying under the step. And it was just good that the children were smart enough to, to know their rights, you know, to do something about it. They, they were really smarter than we were because we had taken this stuff all our lives and, and just waited until our back really got pushed up against the wall before we started doing anything about it. But uh, let somebody else talk. <laughs> No, because maybe you want to talk about the, the Cassie Clark <coughs> episode, or, or maybe. <laughs> but the only thing I I really remember about Cassie Clark, I probably was trying to hold on to pop. 
I was, I was young and wherever he go, I, I was following. And uh, father was unaware of uh, my dogs and so forth. Not that, uh, not that I had any intentions of doing anything. I just probably felt safe being with, with dad wherever he went. And I, I never saw the dog. Uh, I never saw him coming. But uh, it was just, just one, of those, one of those things. I was just, probably just with dad. Have you ever been chased by a dog and, mm -hmm. and almost got bitten? Mm -hmm. Do you know how you felt? I can't, I can't but just try, imagine yes. how a small child that uh, a police dog bit him on the leg. So you can imagine the fear that was in that, that child. You know, the Cassidy Park. Uh, what was Cassidy Park? Cassidy Park was the public park for Bogalusa. And it was a segregated park, and blacks were not allowed to attend. But in the lawsuit, one of the, one of the suits that Daddy filed allowed uh, people to go to Cassidy Park. And one of the things that they had to do, because the police was under an order to protect uh, the wherever we were going to go, and so Daddy made a call and said, "Look, uh, uh, the children are going to go over to Cassidy Park, and." play since it was now legal to do that at, 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 at a court injunction and all that. So the police then made a call to a group of, to the clan or whoever and apparently and there were not a lot of adults with those children. Maybe it was 20, 18, 20 children they were on the slides and that sort of stuff. So the police made a call and explained what was going to happen. So by the time they got there, 10 or 15 minutes after they got there, uh, these clanmen, or the, these, the white men, came down and started attacking the children. And then the police came in. And so the police then started to, uh, in rounding up the blacks, they put the dogs on the, around the blacks. They were not attacking the whites while well, the whites were attacking the blacks. And so in that process, uh, Greg got bit. And then, of course, as you, you've heard the rest of the story. But that's what Cassidy Park was. And Cassidy Park was a park that we had never been allowed to go to uh, and was named after the rich family, the Cassidy's, which my grandmother worked for. Uh, uh, the, who the park was named for, my grandmother had worked for, for the Cassidy's. Can I go to heaven? Dad, tell about your... Ma in your in the march, just tell something about you in the march. How your dad didn't want you to. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, when the march started out from Bogalusa, well, of course I was young. They didn't want me to go. In which march? Cause there was something. This is a march from Baton Rouge from Bogalusa to Baton Rouge. Okay, sixty-six. Sixty-six. Yeah. So one morning, excuse me. One morning. They got well, they were getting the food together. So me, I snuck in the car, got in the car, jumped in the car, cause they had prepared sandwiches for to meet them for lunch. So I got in the back of the car and I'm just riding along and I'm like, I'm gonna get in this march. Yeah, God, they're not gonna leave me behind this time. <laughs> so we got almost to Covington, around Waldheim or somewhere up in, in in that area, and that's where they were gonna break for lunch under this big like oak tree. So I get out the car, helping them bring the food and everything. So I go up to Paul and say, I want to march. No, you can't march, it's too bad. But it really wasn't bad at that point because we were just getting ready to come into Covington and they had, Covington was like the ally to us. They, they were ready for us to come through there, I think. So I talked them into it, they let me march. So that night when we got into Covington, they did the covered wagon thing with the cars and mm -hmm. everybody got in the middle and slept on them. But they brought the kids back. They brought the kids back home and, you know, let them sleep at home. And then in the morning we get back up and go bring the food and meet, meet, the, meet the march. So we marched from Covington. I think we did from Covington to Hammond in a day. And when we got to Hammond, it was really bad that night in Hammond because they were <laughs> they were waiting for us, and we got in. Uh, they didn't want us to use the school, 
uh, Gibson was the principal at the time, uh, the black principal there <coughs> at the time, but uh, the whites didn't want them to use, us to use the school to stay overnight because they knew up the road, Satsuma, and on up the road where it was going to be Denim more. Spring. Denim Springs. And, and all these areas where it was going to be more trouble. So we got there that night, and people were riding, circling, and, you know, they said, okay, we got to get all these kids out of here again. So they sneaked us out again. So the next morning, everybody gets up thinking they're going back, and they said, no. No, no. So... Me and another young lady, uh, Riri, we always wanted to be on the front. And we they had these state police that were on horses. And, you know, they would kind of let that horse lag back. So it was AZ, Paul, and then it was me, then Riri. We were on the front. And... Granny kept kidding. come on, no, y'all come to the back. It's not safe on the front. That's anything happen, that's where it's going to all happen on the front. Because they were, you know, targeting AZ and, and Paul. So we didn't pay that no mind. We, you know, we just walking, holding hand to hand, singing. And we, I guess we started walking too fast. So we got up close to that horse, and AZ came and grabbed me and said, come back here, boy. You get too close to that horse. That horse is going to kick you and knock you out. And he said, that cop not going to let, not going to feel anything. He's going to keep on going. So we, we, well, we slowed up a little bit. And before you know it, we back up there again. And then bringing us back. So we were anxious. And we, you know, we were just young. We, we really didn't know the dangers of, of what was going on and, and how dangerous it was. And then until they pulled us after they left out, we walked a little bit out of hammer. But when they started getting a little into Satsuma, Holden, Robert, and all that, <laughs> that's where they, i never forget that they had a church, a red brick church. And, I, and when I go that back way on 190, they, 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 they would not let the state police take their horses over to that church and get water. They tried to stop there because we had kind of slowed up there. And they told the police was riding over there to go turn the faucet on and let the horse drink the water. And they waved them off. Don't get off the property. Mm -hmm. And that, that's when they took us out then. Mm -hmm. Because they knew it was getting ready to get mm -hmm. the, get back pretty bad. Yeah. They attacked <laughs> the uh, newsman over there in Castle Park took the cameras from him, beat him up, throw the cameras over in that look. It was rough. It was rough. And the bad thing about it is uh, we were supposed to be marching, no, no guns. We had no protection because we had the, the guns <coughs> in different cars. And what they did, uh, when we were parked in Hammond, the policemen came on the ground, the troopers came on the ground, they started searching the car. Father said, hold up, what are you doing? We're searching these cars for guns. Father said, that's an illegal search. Don't touch it. Don't touch our cars. That's an illegal search. So they backed off. They was going to get a permit to uh, to search the cars. In the meantime, put all the guns in our car, got robbed to drive those those guns to get those guns out of there. I was so afraid because we had no communication, and Rob was by himself with a carload of guns. And I, I, I didn't know what was happening to my child or if they had caught him because I heard one of the, the troopers say, just saw that car going out of here with one of them niggas driving it. Said, catch him. And that was my child. So uh, I just, 
we just marched on, but I didn't know what happened to Rob. But so happened Rob had played football and he knew some back roads and that's why they didn't catch him. When I did get a chance to call home, my aunt, the one we was taking that was 106, she said Rob was home. He had made it home. It would be interesting uh, if Rob would tell that, that adventure. I mean, not an adventure, but what yeah. happened. You remember that, Rob? When you drove? Yeah. Talk about it. Oh, well, what happened? I was driving so fast that I missed a turn. And I had to go farther and then come back. If I wouldn't have, if I wouldn't have missed that turn, they would have caught me. But I throwed them off, and I and I came on in. I made a came an, another route. That's the only reason why that they didn't catch me. Carol, did you want to say something a moment ago? Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask? I'm I'm interested in. The range of emotion and feeling and uh, no doubt fear at times, lots of that, um, pride, lots of that, to watch family members, parents, grandparents, take these roles, do these things in conditions like that. I'm just wondering how the emotional complexity of that experience. Well, very emotional. Like I told you about when Rob carried the guns, we, we just didn't know what was going to happen to him. So many times uh, they would call on this group of men that had formed because somebody was in trouble and they needed the group of men to go to their houses to protect them. Sometimes it was even in Mississippi or other places. And just to see uh, those men go out like that, you never knew if they were coming back. They, they were putting their lives on the line to protect other people. So that was always a fear. I was, uh, that the kind of fear that we, we experienced just went on day after day after day. Uh, even when Dad and AZ were negotiating with uh, Governor McKithen and uh, he sent his uh, airplane to pick him up, you never knew uh, because you had seen so many other things uh, happen or you heard about so many things happening. So you never really knew uh, what was going on. You never knew when someone called and said they were in trouble um, to come and help them. Uh, I know one of the times the deacon was going out of town because some of the civil rights workers were trapped in an area, hiding in a bond area, and they had to go out of town to get them. And they were white. Yeah, they were white. And they didn't know if it was a trap. So they had to go through all of this to decide when to go, when not to go, uh, and it looked like they always went. And we always went to try to help somebody. But in the meantime, you know, we would stay on the, the little radio. We had a base at that time. Um, Tell in, us why, in the, why we had the base. In the, in the, in the breakfast room. Um, because when the telephone situation, the way the telephone situation was, uh, when you try to call, they would, they would cut, uh, the operators would cut the phones off. Um, can you say why that was? Because? Yeah, because, uh, oh, sure. Um, when we had to, when we, when daddy reported, uh, an activity that we were involved in, uh, or we said something on the phone, then it was spread to the clans, uh, the whites, uh, who were against us. And uh, when we tried to call for help, they didn't want that to be also, because you have to understand, the operators at that time were related to uh, 
they were not, of course, we had no black operators, so they were all related, and uh, they would notify of the plan that we had. And I think uh, one time we did a setup for um, uh, what Daddy said he, they were going to do was uh, the deacons or so were talking, and that they were going to do a setup, and they called someone to report that they were going to do this, this, and this, and uh, whatever the event was. And then, of course, all the whites came, and, um, y you know, it didn't happen. So that's when we realized what was going on, and they, that's when they, um, they got the radios. Uh, plus, you needed the radios so the deacons could uh, communicate back and forth with what was going on. Um, but it's not... What was hard, the hardest, is that some people were planted. They had informers that would come to our meetings. And we couldn't figure out how every time we got ready to do something, then the clans would always be there. And uh, so, I, you know, I, I was young too, you know, but I, I didn't know those the details that was going on there. But I know in a meeting, uh, they stopped the meeting and they surrounded the people. Um, these were elderly black people and they had taken all the notes and had written everything down. And uh, so daddy and the deacons dealt with that. You know, I, I, I don't know what they, what they did to the people, but they, they dealt with that. Um, so, we get to a point where we have informers, many, from the governor's office coming down like they were FBI's or whatever, just informers, just feeding information back to the governor's office. Um, so it, it never stopped. And we had a part where they put a hit out on my dad. Um, and mama, you have to talk about that. <laughs> well, they they uh, they were paying some black. They were supposed to kill him, but it just so happened uh, we found out about it. And as I said, he never went anywhere alone. He always had someone to to protect him. And at one time, uh, Ms. Hicks, if I can interrupt for one second, do you remember? When in the sequence of events no. that happened? It, I'm, I'm not too. Well, you know, too. you know when they put that. Uh, you remember what time it was? Uh uh When they had that man? No, I don't. I don't know. I remember, but I remember. But it was. But in the neighborhood, it was so much harassment that they have a movement of everything. Them, uh, them guys would be riding in black neighborhood, disturbing them, doing doing things. So that's why they they had the organization, and they would go out and and check out the situation. Cause if they have a march, that'd make them ride and do things to people, burn crosses or whatever. So you know they really patrol the neighborhoods from this side of town to the north side of town. And then you know they had they had uh different men that had to have uh, somebody come pick them up from work at a certain time because there was, there was a threat to their lives. At one time, one of the Klansmen uh, pulled a gun on AZ, put a gun to AZ's head. Uh, they was having trouble at one of the schools that was being integrated and Bob and AZ was over there and one of the men stepped out and put a gun to AZ's head and said they were gonna kill him. And Bob ran to the back of the car, got a gun and, and put to his head, said, you might kill AZ, but I'm gonna kill you. At that time, the policeman grabbed Bob and took Bob to jail. They did nothing to the man that threatened AZ's life. And, uh, they wanted to charge him with attempted murder and all that. And then I just told the policeman 
you're arresting him, he don't have a scar on him, and he better not have a scar on him when we get him back. We went over to the jail, we could not find Bob. We couldn't find him anywhere. <laughs> they had put him in solitary to keep anybody from getting to him. And then I also told him, I'm fixing to go call Judge Hebes and tell him that y'all arrested him, he hadn't done anything, and they protected him. At that time, his mom, who was mm -hmm. very old, and the camera was, was following her. She got out of the car, and she walked very low in stature. And uh, they said, uh, Lady, where are you going? She said, that's my son they arrested, and I'm going to see that my son is all right. And she marched in that, that jail, and, and they let us see, and he said, Mom, I'm okay. You just go on back home. I'm okay. But see, once again, that's that mother's love. She marched right through all those clansmen and went in there to, to check on her son. She was born in 1900. You know, I guess one of the things about fear, uh, and I guess there was two or three types of fear that existed in our community. And of course, one fear was that something was going to happen to you physically. I think another kind of fear was uh, just psychological. And I think to a degree, uh, in stages, that was more challenging and emotionally draining than, any, than the physical fear. Certainly in a march, uh, I was fearful when I marched it. And I didn't march as much as my brothers and sisters because I was in school uh, at Southern, and that's another piece that we'll talk about. But uh, there's always this fear that they're gonna, uh, you gonna get, they're gonna run out and hit you, and nobody likes pain. And I, even when I was a little boy and had to get, well, as children, when you got a whipping, you didn't want it because it hurt, <laughs> and so pain hurt. But I think the psychological fear of having to go emotionally through this every day. And particularly for us as a family uh, to begin with, uh, was just an enormous piece of stress uh, that we never knew uh, when my dad went to work, if he was gonna come back. Uh, and there was a point that they drove him to, to work every day to the box factory. But he had to walk maybe 20 feet they could only take him so far, then he had to get out of the car and walk to the mill. Now, when he got inside the mill, he was well protected because there were black men there and they were going to protect him. So the psychological fear of wondering, and we knew they wanted to kill him. They had built a coffin at one point and put it on Columbia Road, saying that they were going to kill him. Yeah, and here lies yeah, yeah. Robert Hicks. And so the psychological fear of never knowing if this is the day that is not going to come home. Uh, or this is the day uh, when he goes in, but he won't come out. Whether or not he get in, and to have to carry that that mental stress and anguish as a family uh, for years uh, is an enormous kind of emotional stress. And I think that stress did not only exist uh, just with the, I mean, it existed with us because we were a family, and as a family, we had always been a family. And sometimes it, maybe we can talk a little bit about what family life was like before the movement and after the movement. But also uh, the fear that uh, when Mr. Y or, or Ricky, uh, anybody went someplace that was involved in the movement, you didn't know if they were gonna make it. Or when they got arrested, you didn't know what was gonna happen to them. The fear that when they took those young black girls in a jail whether or not they were going to molest them, whether or not they were going to rape them. I mean, all those kinds of psychological fears. And for those people who were marching and things, you never knew what was going to happen. And I think emotionally, that was, that was a piece uh, of the movement that has played an enormous toll on so many people in the movement, not only in Bogalosa, but throughout the country. And it's a piece that really has never been explored, talked about, the psychological effects of the movement uh, on individuals in it. So I, I think that that was a
piece of fear. There was fear of policemen. There was a fear of, of the pos of the the Klan and and the whites attacking you. But there was also the psychological fear, of which you went through every day, of just living in the movement. Let me use that to to turn conversation. We're on. Um, use that as a, as a uh, moment to switch back over to question the deacons because one response that could help and did help um, folks have a different feeling about what might be possible was to know that there was a system that could provide some measure of protection and defense and, and in, in Bogalus that was the deacons obviously and um, we haven't we've talked a lot about the roles that they play but not so much about the deacons themselves and the organization and how you saw that group come together and how you measure its significance? Well, I think because of the deacons, uh, many lives were saved, even though they never killed anyone. But they were there. They they had guns. And uh, I mean, you know, when you go against a gun, it, it could be you or it could be me. So this uh, by the grace of God, they never had to kill anybody. They never had to well, the only person that got shot was, we were on a march, and a white nurse was in the car, and one of the Klansmen was going in the car to pull her out, cursing and was pulling her out, and a black guy <laughs> shot him. And that's the only time that uh, anyone was shot. But uh, those men uh, stood up, Whenever was any trouble, they were there, and uh, I, I'm sure uh, Fletcher told you Martin Luther King was this nonviolent man that didn't believe in guns. And when we went to that Meredith march, when King got ready to march, he looked around and said, "Where are the deacons?" I'm sure uh, Fletcher told you, and uh, it was just that protection and, and those you had some strong black men that they they have ju had just taken so much that they were ready to put their lives up for protection yeah that's that's what you just said you know that's when i heard those stories that was one of the couple of the most amazing stories i ever had heard <clears throat> when fletcher told about how king wouldn't move without right. the deacon and another story that he told that you guys probably also <coughs> was that but Meredith integrated Ole Miss, they had problems until the deacons came. Yeah. And they did not have a problem from that very moment that they arrived. I never heard that story until till, uh, I heard Fletcher tell it uh, after, my, after my dad had died. I never knew that story. It was so much about the deacons <clears throat> that we knew what they were doing, but we but were not safe, were not allowed, was always told not to say, to don't expose these, 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 young, these men. To uh, to get their names out because of fear of what what may happen to them <coughs> in their family life. They had um, the movie uh, with uh, Forrest Whitaker and uh, Oscar, <coughs> Oscar, Oscar Davis Oscar Davis and uh, Silverman. Yeah. Jonathan Silverman. They on the uh, they they talked about the deacons and asking. Uh, why was it that when they were in the process of doing the, the movie that they tried to get information about the deacons and why was it they couldn't get any information and why was it that the people in Bogalusa act as if they were ashamed of what they had done and uh, we just smiled when we saw that. Uh, at that time, uh, I really wanted to write them and tell them what it was what the situation was, but uh, my father was still living then. And um, so I said, now that my father's not here, and uh, I'm not gonna give all the names, but I can tell you, we could not give information out because the FBI, when we gave information out, the FBI, who we had many times seen associating with the, uh, the police officers, and the police officers were the one to attack us with the other whites. And so when you put that together, 
then you don't really want to share information because it endangers the deacon's lives. So no, we would not tell, you don't discuss what happens with the deacon. You don't discuss uh, the sickness that they have. It's just those things you just don't, you just don't discuss. And uh, of course we are proud. Everybody, so many people uh, that's living now is because of the protection from the deacons. And my dad always said, uh, what kind of man, uh, you know, Martin Luther King was a good man. He had a dream, but my dad had fought for the dream. And it was his right to fight for the dream. You have a constitutional right, and that's what daddy said. I have a right to bear arms. And if I am, uh, if I need to protect my family, especially when the police did not protect us, then he had a right to do that. The deacons had a right to carry the gun. McKiffin, Governor McKiffin came on television and said, I know that they have a right to carry those guns. I know that. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to take every gun away from them that I can to disarm them. And it would take a period of time before they can get their guns back. And that was his plan. And if we have to go to court, we have to go to court. But at least I'll get the guns out of the uh, black men in, uh, in, you know, in Bogalusa. Um, but no, we, the deacons had the gun for protection. And uh, that was it. When uh, the deputy sheriff, uh, O'Neill Moore and Creed Rogers were killed in uh, the Angie Bonito area, um, now, understand that we didn't have any black police officers or sheriffs at all and that was one of the things that they asked for daddy and uh i say daddy i mean daddy the bogalusa voters lead uh they that's one of the things that the lawyers wrote up and presented to the mayor presented to the governor uh we wanted to have black police officers and we got them now what people don't know is the deacons for a long period of time, because we know it was a setup, they protected the police, the deputy sheriff. Everything was going on fine. Everything was okay. And uh, then it happened. Um, and my daddy really felt bad about that. Um, But that was going to happen. That was the setup anyway. It was going to happen. When they called the wife, Mayvella, and told her to get out of the house, that they were going to kill the family, it was the deacons, all of the deacons, that went up there to protect the, the Moore family and brought them back into the home. Uh, Mayvella Moore tells the story all the time. Um, so they saved that life. You see articles all the time in the paper where people respond about the deacon that came through Bogalusa, how the deacon saved their lives. Um, so no, it's just not a, you know, just a group of black men with guns, just carrying guns and shooting or whatever. No, we were not the clans in attitudes. We had men to protect the families, and that's exactly what happened. So that was... Uh, you know that was the deacons that uh, that we saw and um, that we felt safe about. Tell them about the man, to the debt that cannot be repaid. Um, oftentimes, when the civil rights workers came in and we were going back and forth to court, um, the deacons would go back and forth with them to court, and um, he got New Orleans. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, in the, a federal court down in New Orleans. And uh, they just would know. They would find out. They had so many leaks or so. They would find out what new, I guess they look at the license plates or so, and they discover, you know, this is this is somebody new coming in. And so the clans would be behind them, right behind them. And um, 
So we had uh, we had deacons who knew the route, just as Rob did. You know, different ways to go and to to uh, try to protect the people coming in. You had to bring them in. You had to had to meet them. You had to bring them in. That's why they got the crossing of the book, the crossing Border Street. You know, you have to protect the men that's coming in and uh, the civil rights workers going out. That was a constant thing that we had to do. When Malcolm X was assassinated, and that was a day after my father's birthday. My father was born February the 20th. I think Malcolm X was assassinated on the 21st. The Deacons for Defense, the chapter in, Bo chapter in Bogalusa was born. And we felt safe after that. One of the things that uh, the Bogalusa Voters League and that organization did was to have the black, white signs removed at the federal building, black, white, at the courthouse where my husband worked, Crown Zellerback, black, white, service stations everywhere. And uh, we put on uh, drives to get uh, black people registered to vote. I remember one old lady, I think she was related to Ricky Hill too. She went to the courthouse and she, she was very old, like 90 years old or something. And they have an elevator there. And they wouldn't let her go, wouldn't let her use the elevator to go upstairs to register. And she said, don't worry about it, baby. I'll crawl up. she crawl up the stairs. So that's, that's, you know, that's the kind of strongness that was developed here in, in Bogalusa. We stopped shopping here at Bogalusa. Yeah. You, the, uh, so many stores from the main street, gone. We, we, we stopped shopping and we'd go other places to shop. And uh, every time they'd have a big affairs where they were, uh, the whites were up in there having a big party at one of the fabulous restaurants they had. We got a group of people and go test it. And those people would leave. So we end up, we got that rest, that fabulous restaurants closed. So uh, anything that the league could do to betterment the blacks, we did it. We, we just worked on it, we did it. We marched every day, every day we marched. We burned up a lot of police cars, but we marched every day. You know, can I just ask one mm -hmm. thing? How are folks doing? Does anybody feel like they need a break or? <laughs> we're okay. Doing okay? Or, we, mm -hmm. We're used to this. So many times when the family would just get together, I don't know why we never uh, were gone and uh, uh, what? Tape. Tape, tape it? Yeah. We just talk about it and mm -hmm. just talk about it. I remember every time we would get with Gail and we were marching and uh, they wouldn't let a group of people join the march. And uh, one of the uh, policemen pulled a gun on a lady and told her she couldn't join that march or he'd shoot her. And she told him, and your mama will miss you from supper tonight. <laughs> so they, they can't remember that. <laughs> she said, your mama miss you from supper tonight. But, uh, you know, once they were determined to do things, they did it. They did it. And uh, the children caught it in school. They had to fight. They had to fight in school. That was all the time. We just go kept going down there. And uh, I went in with... Uh, the the judge called us in one day and uh, the judge uh, and Dick brought us in and uh, the judge was talking to us and he was telling them that he was going to protect our children and let them keep going to school and, and how he was going to protect them. And I said, uh, 
wait a minute, Judge, I want to tell you something. I said, I I've heard about how you was going to protect them, but our children go to school and they attack attacked every day. I said, every time my telephone rang, my heart is in my mouth because my, my children are over there. And you have not protected them. You told us you was going to protect them, but you haven't protected them. They're still getting beat up over there. He said, let me tell you something, Miss Hicks. I told you I was going to protect them, and I'm going to protect them. He put a fine on them that if one child got attacked over there, how much the school was going to have to pay. And we walked out of the chamber, and Dix overlooked at me, and he said, Jackie, do you know you're not supposed to talk to the judge? <laughs> He said, I'm the lawyer. You're not supposed to talk to the judge. He said, but I want you to know you did a hell of a job up in there. <laughs> I said, those are my children, Dick. That's not the judge's children. And, and it was such a small amount of them. They, they didn't have a chance over there. And he was the one who told us to send those children over there. And I felt like he had a right to do something about it. You were talking about the deacons and what the influence that it had. And I think one of the things that the deacons did, when you look at them, uh, and of course they didn't start in Boca Rosa, they started in Jonesboro. Uh, and we were one of the first chapters after that. Uh, but one of the things that the deacons did, the role that they played was certainly to protect the community and to protect families. And I think for us as a family, being a Mark family, uh, we got super protection. Uh, we never went any place 24-7 without being escorted by the deacons. So our whole world changed and we were all protected. And I think when you look at the deacons, I often say there were two kinds of deacons. There was a group with Fletcher and Charles Sims and that whole group. And, but out of that came another group of deacons, which were what I call the unofficial deacons. And that was a group of black men who did not guard our house, but uh, were in a neighborhood, and they guarded their neighborhood. The man mm -hmm. came home from work, and that uh, there were three black men in that on that street. Then uh, one night, Mr. Smith guarded the street. If somebody came down there, a car they didn't recognize, he was there. And they spent nights laying in the front of their house on the floor guarding. The next night, Mr. Broomfield guarded the street. And so one of the interesting things that the, the deacons did, one of the roles that they played, is that they created a self-empowerment, self-protection, not only as an organization, but as, as pride in the community. The black men began to say, you know, I'm going to take this step. I'm going to be, I'm going to do what the deacons are doing, you know, and the deacons had a role because there were people who were in the movement, there were leaders, and they needed to be protected. And those leaders were the leaders of the Bogalusa Voters League. And the role that they were playing was to fight the fight, to lead the marches, to file the suits, and do all that. But we needed the deacons, you know, to protect the leaders and the families, the Mark families. But then it became a second group that uh, in the community. And that, that group uh, became an unofficial group of uh, deacons. And that was all over Bogalusa in terms of blacks uh, organizing among themselves from popular quarters uh, to Bogalusa to wherever. You know, you had that kind of thing that happened because the, the deacons got organized. And that began you, to, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. You may want to let Mama talk about uh, Bloody Wednesday uh, in uh, in uh, in Bogalusa. Fourth Street. Uh -huh. Fourth Street. Yeah. You uh, could do that? Yeah. Uh, AZ was in in the hospital. Something happened, they had arrested Bob. Poor Bob just stayed in jail so much, but he come out and he'd fight right on. The, the, a group of people decided they were gonna march at night. And they started to march and the policemen surrounded, they had no leader there. They, they surrounded them, they start beating the people, they call it Bloody Wednesday. They beat every black person they could, they had buses, they load them up on buses, and uh, 
people coming from work didn't even know what was happening. They just beat them and throw them in the bus too. People that were in the restaurants, they went and pulled them out and took them to jail. And uh, they just had a whole group of black people, men and women, down there in jail. And uh, this is this is what they call it, the, the Bloody Wednesday, because they beat those people up. They, their leaders were, were not with them. They didn't have any, anyone to really protect them. But you were down there. Yeah, but it wasn't that much I could, <laughs> I could do. They're trying to get yeah. you to tell about when you and Gail were in the car. <laughs> when they you tried to get you to come out. Oh, yeah. Uh, the policeman, uh, when the policeman came to the car, Mary was Mary. there. Mary Williams, I'm sorry. And they came to the car and they they uh, snatched on the door and uh, said, come on out of here. And I just picked my gun up off my lap and pointed to him, told him I wasn't moving. Mm. I was not moving. So Mary and I stayed in the car. Then we locked the door and Bertrand Wire came and got us. Bertrand and, and Reese Perkins Perkin came Perkin down came and, and got down. us and, and carried us home. Mm -hmm. But they, we must have been the only people that didn't get put in jail down there. Because I refused, I put, took my pistol and pointed right at him. I said, I'm not getting out of this car. I was not getting out of that car. And it was sort of like a reaction uh, that a lot of these people who decided to march had not necessarily been involved in the march mm -hmm. as such. <laughs> and 4th Street was like uh, the center of entertainment for Black Vogelusa. Uh There must have been 24 different bars and you know places there, little restaurants and things. But that was black, pool halls, that was black life. But a lot of the people who were down there on that Wednesday, mm -hmm. uh, when they heard that Daddy had gotten arrested, and a couple of other people had gotten arrested. As my daddy says in the film, he said, you know, when, when Bogalusa folks, get, uh, black folks make up their mind to do something, you can't stop them. He, has a famous, he said that all the time. And so they decided they were going to march because Daddy had been arrested and <laughs> Gail and uh, people in the Voters League. So they decided, we gonna, we, you know, this is going to be the people's march. <laughs> And so Mama Nell went down That's and said, wait, y'all can't do it that way. You don't have a permit, you don't have this. And see, we were on a court order. It was twofold. Whenever we did anything, we were to notify the police department. And it was like that. But they decided they were going to do it anyway. <laughs> and so they started this march. And then they called in all those police because they were marching illegal. And they beat everybody they could, locked mm -hmm. them up. And if you happen to be getting out for work at 4 o'clock, mm -hmm. walking down the street, they beat you and threw you in. <laughs> the result of that, however, was that all those people who had not been involved in the march got involved in the march. <laughs> I need to get a drink of water. Let's take a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're rolling again. Okay, we just are back from a little break. I, I wanted to... I wanted to ask you all for your perspective about the following. Um, there's a kind of a there's a kind of a culmination in in July of '65 when um, after all that tension through the spring and it gets to July and I think A. Z. Young says, you know, we're on the verge of a civil war here. It's tensions have kind of peaked, and uh, and the federal government intervenes in a certain kind of way. John Doerr comes from the Justice Department and. <laughs> Some suits are filed. <laughs> uh, no and, want to talk about John Doe. And so people people <laughs> think about that moment. Some people look at that moment and they say one thing. Some people look at that moment and they say another. And I'm wondering about your perspective about the transition across kind of that moment in the summer of 65 and going on from there. Because Bloody Wednesday is after that, for example. And lots of other things keep happening. And, you know, there's a lot of... But I'm wondering about how you feel about Changed, you know, what changed, what didn't change. Should I tell you something about John Doe? John Doe, we were at a meeting at A. Z. Young's house, and John Doe's group of men that he had in here had done nothing but what you doing on the table, <coughs> looking at things, writing it down. They stood up there and watched those uh, barbers connect their holes to a hot water tank and and uh, put it on those 
young white civil rights workers that was picketing. And all they did was they wrote it down. And a, a lot of things they saw, they wrote it down. So then John Doe came in and he had this big meeting with us and he was so proud of what his men, his men had done. And I was tired, we had been working, I was tired. And then I just kind of sit up and I told him, you and your men are not doing anything. We don't need you to write notes, we can write notes. If you're gonna write notes and do nothing with it, we don't need, we had problem with some of the FBI agents too. I, maybe they're better, but it's some of them I don't care too much about because they didn't help out either. And a lot of time they get that information, they sit on it. They, they have enough information <coughs> to do things with and they don't do it. And John Doe was one of those people, and then I just told him how I felt about him, and AZ was very upset with me because John Doe was the big man, but he hadn't done anything, and was it wasn't any reason to sugarcoat him. Hmm. Well, I guess the way I kind of look at part of that is I don't see after. 65 where justice was served. Uh, I don't see where they arrested anybody. Uh, I don't see where they put anybody in jail. I don't see where they put restrictions. They put uh, blacks? Uh, in terms of progress uh, in, in this whole struggle. Uh, and that when you begin to look at 65 uh, to 2005, uh, you know, you still say that there are uh, educational problems in uh, the African American community. Uh, there's still high unemployment in, in the black community. Um, there's still um, problems uh, getting uh, jobs. Um, there's still many of the problems that we had in sixty uh, in the early sixties. Uh, are still here in different kinds of, uh, of ways. Uh, we have certainly a high uh, prison population that is continuing. Uh, we have drugs in, uh, in the African American community, and, and African Americans don't have the resources to bring drugs into their communities in the way that they're being brought. Uh, certainly, that this has to do with uh, a bigger picture. Uh, and there's this whole issue about of the war on poverty uh, and the war on drugs and how that was out and even the, uh, the war in Vietnam and the change of the contraband and the drugs and all those issues. Uh, so you begin to wonder, uh, though there has been progress in terms of public accommodations and, and the issue really in the move, when the movement began for many uh, people in the, in the movement was not about public accommodation, it was about jobs and economic fairness. And I think it became an issue that won the press and part of some of the civil rights, major civil rights organizations that came out of a Quaker movement, uh, a philosophy of nonviolence and, and all of that, and felt that part of this also be public accommodations, getting people to accept you, and perhaps with the idea that if you accepted us, if we could eat with you, you would accept us. And, but that, eating in restaurants didn't get us any jobs. You know, and so those become crucial <coughs> issues. Uh, whether or not we have, uh, we're better off now that we've integrated schools, uh, uh, is it, certainly up for debate. Uh, and the mechanism of selective uh, segregation, uh, de facto segregation, all these problems exist uh, today. And certainly one of the things that, we, and I think when you start to look at the civil rights movement in small towns composed as opposed to places like Atlanta, New Orleans, Birmingham, uh, when those movements happened, uh, Baton Rouge or wherever, you had a massive support system. Uh, first of all, you had more people. You usually you had a young uh, you had a young you had young people from colleges that participated in, in that fight. But in small towns throughout the South, 
the movement was different. The whole fight was different. Because, number one, you didn't have the peace people, you didn't have the resources, and you didn't have always the support. And so it was a whole different kind of fight. And still today, those problems uh, to, a to a degree still exist in small towns. Uh, that the problem, the advantages that you have in a public school in New Orleans and the resources are different from the schools in, in Bogalusa. You know, so when we begin to look at what progress has been made, certainly we've made progress in terms of public accommodation and certain other minor places, and certainly uh, we have the right to vote, uh, and we <coughs> vote in larger numbers. But when you get down to the bread and butter of it, you know, uh, we have not made as much progress as people would like to believe, lead us to believe that we have. Uh, and so my take is that uh, we have a long ways to go, and that we made some enormous sacrifices, uh, and it has not paid off. Uh, as King once said, there's still a check that is yet uh, cash, yet to be cashed. It's hard to answer that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, anybody else want to talk a little bit about? Well, uh, Charles didn't tell you uh, he was at school, Southern University State School, and he got out of school. He and one of his little friends and came over to March in a March with us. They expelled them from school. And uh, Bob had made a uh, Bob made a tape that someone come over and tape this not in the best uh, condition now. But anyway, uh, Bob had a beef with uh, John McKithen anyway because he had put his son out of school because he marched in the march. So uh, the people that were in the high places that could have helped us out, they didn't. And then the few uh, white people who did try to stand up to help us out, they retaliated against them. So they, they just did like most black people do. They kept their mouths shut and sit down and didn't do anything. Charles, did you want to talk about that? <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, and I don't know if that uh, is really, you know, in terms of your question, but as an experience. Uh, uh, and I think one of the things about this family is that each one of us, and it'd be interesting, and I think you have some notes about uh, different experiences that each one of us had. And of course, one of my experiences was that I was expelled from Southern <coughs> University. And uh, one evening, the Dean of Men called me and some friends at Southern End uh, and said, uh, I need to talk to you all. You know, we have some uh, Peace Corps volunteers on campus and you all have been uh, interacting with them and we're concerned this is the first time we've had Peace Corps volunteers on campus. And we don't want, and they were white basically, and uh, we don't want any problems. And we have a concern that we don't want to have any problems. And so we explained to the dean that we were being, we just had formed a friendship. We would all eat dinner together and sit out on the quad and uh, or someplace and talk and share experiences and stuff. And they were from all over the country. And uh, he said, "Well, we're very concerned about this." And uh, it was supposed to have been six of us in that uh, in that meeting about six o'clock in the evening. So then he said, uh, "The dean of men said, okay, well, I, that's what I wanted to talk to you about." And then as we got ready to leave, he said, "Mr. Hicks, I need you to stay." And so I had been, I was active in student government, so I thought he wanted to talk to me about something with student government. He said, Mr. Hicks, we, we've identified you as the main source of concern here, and that uh, we've decided that uh, we need to expel you. Uh, and I thought, I, had no, I knew Dean Jones well, so I said, sure, Dean Jones, right, expel me. And he said, I'm serious, Mr. Hicks. I said, sure, serious, and I'm, Ch I'm, I'm Chuck Hicks. And he said, I'm not playing. He said, I want you to pack your stuff and get off this campus <coughs> immediately. Uh, and I think that that perhaps was
was the most devastating thing, devastating thing that had ever happened to me. I'm sure it was at that time. Uh, number one was that uh, I was the first generation in my family to go to college. I remember when you, uh, they would come to high schools and you had to take the test uh, for the Army. And I remember uh, we were in the dining room and, it, and the man, the recruiting officer told me, I said, I don't need to take that because I'm going to college. And so with this concept of mine of going to college and being in, being, being in college and finishing for college was, I mean, that was what I was supposed to do. That's what I planned. Uh, I knew from there when I, since I was in ninth grade that I was going to college. And so all of a sudden to be told, hey, you're out. And I want you out, not tomorrow, but now. And there was no hearing, no judicial process. We had a student court to hound thing, nothing. I just had to get off that campus. It reminded me when I think back to when uh, the students marched on Southern University from Southern University and mar marched on the Capitol. And uh, after they did that, the president called them in and he said, I want you to take every piece of paper, every pencil, every pen. I want everybody to be off this campus in 24 hours. And anything that you leave on this campus will be destroyed. And we will readmit you one by one. I mean, that, that was the same kind of thing, only it was an individual case. And I remember <coughs> that I called home and I said, I'm being kicked out of school and I didn't do anything. And I oftentimes reflect back on it and I said, you know, I think that if suicide had entered my life, <coughs> I probably would have taken seriously of committing it. Uh, Southern is located on the banks of the Mississippi. And that's a picture of me in the yearbook where I walked out on one of those long things that walked into the, I, I, I probably reflecting back, uh, that would have been, I mean, I just felt that I was being put in a position where I was the beginning of hope. I was the new generation. I was the new beginning for my family. You know, I was the first one to go to college. And here I was, that being taken. And that was absolutely devastating. It happened when? Uh, 63, Three. Three, four, about 65, I, I think it was. 66. 66. 66. You graduated no. in 63. Yeah, I graduated 63. in 63, and that was, I was a junior, I think, a sophomore, something around that time. But one of the things that I didn't know was that because of the conflict happening between the Bogalusa Voters League, vis be my dad and the governor, uh, and uh, they had had a meeting with the governor. And the governor uh, had wanted a cooling off period, and they refused. And uh, they refused to, to have a cooling off period because the governor had, had not met the demands of the Bogalusa Voters League. So when they flew them back from Baton Rouge, he had a press conference and announced that the Bogalusa Voters League had agreed to a press conference. And my dad said, when they got back, it was A. Z. Uh, Gail Jenkins, I think R. T. It was just A. Z. and Bob and Daddy. Okay, uh, he said that there were 250 black people in the union hall mad as hell at them. And it took them an hour to convince them people that they had not sold them out. <laughs> and you know, they said, what is this? You know, we've been beat, we've been spit on, we've been all this and y'all go off and, and we ain't got nothing. And he kept saying, so they called a press conference. And in return said, the governor is mistaken, the, the boycott will continue. And at that point, the governor was against the wall. And of course he began a personal attack on the Hicks family. Uh, and I became a victim. Now my sister Barbara was at Dillard. And don't they tell, I don't want to and they tried don't no no no. <laughs> no, this is that they tried to find a way to expel her. But she was at a private school and Southern was a state school. And because uh, the the state the Southern University was under auspices of the governor, he ordered that I be expelled. Uh, and so that was just uh, uh, the most devastating thing that that uh, that I went through uh, in terms of a, a, a personal experience uh, the one thing, in a movie. The one thing when Charles called and told us that he had been expelled and he was in tears and I said, uh, Charles, don't worry about it. You got a mom and a dad who loves you and you will go to school. You don't have to go there. 
And uh, he said, but I didn't do anything. We knew he hadn't done anything. We knew exactly what happened. Uh, McKithen was getting at Bob because Bob and AZ would not call that boycott on. And the, the people he and Bogalusa was down his back. So uh, that's what happened there. When, um, I just want to go back a little bit. Um, when the civil rights movement started and uh, the core workers, <coughs> all the students from California, Berkeley, all of us came in. And um, the first one stayed at our house. And then thereafter, uh, we had a lot of <coughs> civil rights workers to stay at our house. Then it expanded through the community. And, um, but that change, one of the things that happened, and <coughs> with all the threats from the clans, one of the things that happened is that we could no longer sleep in our beds. Um, because you had, uh, my room was given to to my sister in my room was given to the civil rights workers there. Um, in the front part of the house, the living room and the dining room area, uh, it was the deacons and all of their guns. Um, and in the, the boys' room, um, I really don't know how we did that. We just, that's where we were in that, that area. So, we changed from never sleeping in pajamas anymore, uh, taking baths early because all the lights had to be out uh, at a certain time so, you, you know, so they didn't have lights so they can see what was going on in the home. Uh, we all knew and we were aware of the deacons on the top of the roof, just all over. Deacons were all over and when we walked we had to be careful because you had to walk past deacons and you had to walk past guns. So that went on, it seems like a long time. When I left and went out to college, uh, there were many problems. Um, of course, you're in college, you're trying to concentrate, you hear the news, you get a telephone call, everything that's happening in uh, Bogalusa, and you just you just could not put yourself into what you were there for. Uh, it was very hard. In addition to that, you were trying to do your own thing. The things that were that were happening there, you tried to uh, get people involved with the movement. You would go out for voters registration, the help of the different organizations. Uh, uh, Rap Brown came in, he spoke, well, not Rap Brown anymore, but he spoke, uh, just a lot of things that just, that was constantly going on. And it went on and went on until, I think either the, the graduation itself or right before the, the, the church sermon, whatever it was, uh, that was the incident in Bogalusa. My mom couldn't come. She couldn't come to, was it the graduation or the, the whatever was going on, the baccalaureate, the Sunday thing or whatever. Something had happened. Somebody had fired in the house. Somebody had done something to someone. So they, they couldn't make it. So all of that was affecting you. Um, so once I was, uh, I served as the first black director of nursing for the city of New Orleans Department of Health. Mm -hmm. And they had someone to come to the office and he wanted to do a book and he wanted to interview me. And it was as if I had never been in the civil rights movement. I had successfully taken everything and took it out of my mind completely. And uh, he was asking me about people, just major things that happened. I said, I just don't remember. <laughs> I just don't remember. So he finally closed his little paper, you know, and then he left or so. Um, but over the years, because my father talked civil rights, 
and human rights all the time. And so a little bit with support, it just start coming back and coming back. But that's the kind of psychological effect that it had. It was so bad and you worried so much about dad and mama being hurt or killed or whatever until you tried to put it out of your mind. And uh, that's not good. That wasn't good. <laughs> Uh, my baby sister, who's dead now, um, she wrote a book, Hidden Shadows, and I'm going to share that with you. Um, she explains how her whole life, and I think she was like 13, she explains how her whole life, how she missed when civil rights started in our, in our town, how her mom and dad were taken away from her and so she missed all of her mom and dad per se she didn't have them there because when you walked in the house somebody was there all bloody uh, you had someone uh, like taking a deposition or so on the floor writing getting the story you had uh, mom and dad always involved in something um, <coughs> <clears throat> there was no more life um, we could not we didn't have the friends that we had before because uh, they were afraid and so the association was different we had problems in school because the teachers many of the teachers did not participate in the movement and uh, they would talk about mom and dad uh, why they starting all this mess. And so that would go on and on. And we got all of this. So you try to, you try to deal with it in a way that you could go on with your life. But uh, as I was telling someone not too long ago, uh, the civil rights movement and the experience that I went through with Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, those experiences will always affect you some kind of way. And by learning from my mom and dad, it's hard, it's hard not to see uh, prejudice or uh, a biased situation. Um, <laughs> went through a situation with my mom and uh, just last week. And I said, I don't want to go over the whole situation. But I said to Mama, Mama, you know what Daddy would have said? If it sounds like racism, if you look and you see that it's racism, and you hear racism, he said, it is racism. And that's what I saw three days, four days ago. Discrimination on age, uh, gender, and race. 82-year-old black female just, just was discriminated against. And uh, so I think my father, because my father has given something, even though we went through everything we went through, I learned so much from him, and he's given us so much until we can... <laughs> we cannot rest until injustice is really uh, until we have justice for everybody until freedom is here until you have respect for 82 year old black female uh, here in Bogalusa it's right there for you and you have to stand up and you have to do what you have to do and as we like to say as Hicks you know, the Bob Hicks came out of us. And so you stand up and you do what you have to do. Um, so the effect on the entire family, I don't know how <coughs> my other uh, siblings feel, but um, it's, it's the civil rights movement and the injustice that we went through as a family 
will uh, remain with us uh, forever. Forever. Folks want to evaluate the, the things that were better and the things that were harder. I listened to some of the things Barbara was saying and kind of surprised at some of the things she said because I got some similar beliefs in, in some of the things she said. I was young, I had a happy childhood, probably up until the time the civil rights uh, movement started. We was, we was totally involved as a, as a family. We did everything. We, we believed that the things we were doing was, was the good and the right thing to do. But I think the effect that it had on me from seeing Governor Kipton in the house and, and uh, the way he, he would uh, try to manipulate the, uh, the black leaders and, and seeing all the, the things in, in my young life, it gave me a nasty taste for politics and anything. I have never been, since, the, since I left, left home, been involved in anything after the politics that did not sit nice with me. I, I, I just, I don't do it. I, uh, one of the things I always remember when my little sister said, uh, she, she, she believed that if people in this country would leave the kids alone, they would straighten it out. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you stop, you, you know, you, you teach them values, you teach them good, you, take, you teach them the things that are good. But you let you let young kids you let young kids come together and be themselves, and and that will that will get rid of all your your, your prejudices and and racial stuff. Just let the kids the kids alone, and and I and I believe that that you know it's like I say I don't I don't want anything to do with politics. My, my brother and sister can tell you the things they do, they, they try to involve me too. I I rather go and do work. You know, I think Charles made that statement before. And, uh, that that's what I do well, but I don't think so. I think I, I do a lot of things well. I just don't have the taste for it. It, it, it destroyed that, that that taste in in that. Now I, I still have a sense of, uh, of of what's fair and what's right, and I, I, I think what it also did to did to me, my later version of idea about about racism is just just American greed. I think that drives prejudice and racism more than anything else in this country is greed. If, if you got on a, a, on, a, on a nice suit, you want a better suit tomorrow. If you're driving a nice car, you want a better car tomorrow, it's greed. You, you can look at things, at least from my per perspective, when I look at things in this country, it's, it's greed that's pushing this country down. And, some, and, and, and with greed, you come, come with family pride because if I'm greed, if, I, if I'm, I'm, I'm a, a uh, uh, advocate of greed, then my greed just don't extend for myself and my family too, and, and and that's where, in my belief, that a lot of the prejudice come in because I'm not gonna let anybody interfere or disrupt that. But but I think that's my perspective on the civil rights movement, what it did to me as a as a, a kid that was, had a happy, very happy childhood, went to went to all all white school, got jumped on practically every day, if not me, one one of my my fellow classmates and, and I, I got tired. I I don't have I don't have a taste for it. Uh, I, 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 that's what I think it did to me. I think it changed my uh, my way that that I grew up as a child to the way that I see things as a, as an older person as a man. Yeah, I, I I don't like the way the greed and and prejudice of this country it, it, it goes. I, Well, I worked in the plant behind my father. They uh, they made him a supervisor, you know. The, and I came to work in the plant. What happened to me? They couldn't they couldn't uh, do anything to him because how he was tired. So all of his all the problems fell on me. They they did me things. Understand they all this all the all the pressure of what they could do to him fell right on me. I was harassed and and mistreated because of him, you know. But and and a lot of times I wasn't in a situation to do nothing about it because there were so many against me, you know. So you know, and but I dealt with you know.
just another experience. I don't get experience don't get them to make you stronger in some other ways. Mm -hmm. Not more understanding about different things. Mm -hmm. But don't kill you makes you stronger, Ralph. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's one thing me and Bob always said. That uh, anything we experience, if it don't kill you, it will make you stronger. And I think about things that I accomplished in life, and I think about uh, the path I took. And when I kind of got off the path, he would kind of encourage me, okay, remember this is what you are working for, and this is your goal. And he always, he was like a supporter. And I think by being in the civil rights movement and seeing somewhat of the progress that he did make, some of the changes that his marches, our marches made, made me stronger. So when I got on the job and I had different activities or different things that happened to me, and I knew it was prejudice that uh, caused the people to treat me the way they did, I was able to to, to uh, survive. I was able to think about, okay, now if I do A, then B is gonna happen because Bob has always taught us you have to have a plan. You can't just go in there and just do what you feel. You have to do things that would help the situation and not hurt it. So it made me stop and think because at one point in my life, I remember I was very hot-headed and he was saying, you know, you need to do this and you need to do that. And, you know, up until the time he passed, he was still giving me advice, you know. And it was like, uh, I think because of the civil rights movement, like I said, it just made me stronger. It made me to think logically about things on, uh, on the job, when I give advice to my children and grandchildren, it's things that he has taught me, you know, and other people in my life. And Jack and Bob has always been like, uh, you know, the best advisor. They would, they never judged us. They always advised us. And I, that's what I try to do for my children too. And you know, the thing about, uh, the the thing about Rob having the same you know named after his dad uh, and going through that experience at Crown Zellerback, uh, that was always that was always a problem that that was it was always a problem because uh, they would take what your parents were doing. And then they'll they'll inflict that on the children, and it was just something that we had to deal with, and it was very very hard. But what I wanted to say was, um, after Daddy's death, we've had uh, many white people and many black people to come and call and <coughs> say how fair Daddy was at that meal not only to to the black but to the white that he was the best supervisor that uh he just was a fair man and one of the sons of a person at the mill in the supervisor position that he had a lot of problems with his son recalls when daddy came to his house and he gave him a uh uh they served him a coca-cola and daddy reached in his pocket and gave the little boy a quarter or a dime or whatever it was. And he said he didn't know why, but he was so happy that Mr. Hicks had given him that, that quarter dime. But he said, that's why I always remembered him. And he wanted to call us and tell us that his dad never said anything bad about my daddy Well, when he wasn't there. And I thought that was that was whatever, <laughs> but um, they always talk about about the fairness, and then it was what he did. It benefits black and whites in Bogalusa <coughs> and just just everywhere, uh, wherever Daddy saw uh, injustice, he would address it anywhere. The hospital where we could only go to hospitals on certain days, he filed a suit. 
housing. There was a problem with housing where they want to put it in only the black neighborhood and wouldn't get oh, any God. information, advice as to co uh, committee or whatever. He stopped the housing. He public made it housing. public housing. Yeah. Um, uh, the education, not the education, the fair employment for men and women. Now, Mama likes to talk about that. Daddy was always concerned that if a woman does the same job that a man is doing, then you pay him the same. And he always wanted to fight for that. He also had a passion, and you can clearly see uh, with what's happening with the mass incarceration of African Americans in this country. Uh, he would say, look at those black boys. Just look at all these black boys that they have put in prison, and some of them for reasons that they should not have been in prison, but they that's the way it was. They were accused. Some deserved to be there, but uh, the majority, the whole idea was, look what the society is doing. And I heard him, but I really didn't know that he had gotten to a point that he had sort of moved, and I think you might hear a little this about what King did in one of his last speeches, mm -hmm. where he began to move from the civil rights to the human rights. And um, I didn't understand exactly where he was going until I heard Michelle Alexander talking about the new Jim Crow with the mass incarceration. And it was like, my daddy was so smart, he was already beginning to get there, to let us see what you are doing to the black men and boys in America. And then once again, you know, shame on you America, shame on you for what you're doing to those black boys and people of color. And uh, I, 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 I can't even, I can't even discuss it. When you, when you go down to the to the prison, and you see more the percentage, the large numbers of black men that they have working, strong, good, looking black men. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's a problem. That's a problem. And the only thing I can say, you know, I know we're limited here, but the only thing I can say is for America to look at the mass incarceration of African American men and uh, people of color and do something about it. And that's, that's it. Oh, thank you, Sam. <laughs> okay, Dara, you want to tell how it affects the kids? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> Greg and Rob had the opportunity to work at the mill through fall and during the summer when they would come home. But I don't know if y'all remember one summer I came home from Southern and I said, I want to work at the mill this summer. So I went, put in my application, and he never called. So I said, Paul, they ain't never, they ain't, they ain't never called me. Right. Everybody didn't work two weeks. It's two weeks into the summer. So he said, let me check on him. So he called Bryn J and whoever was out there at the time at the at the mill and human resources. And he said, yeah, we got the application. But we've done all the hiring. He said, well, y'all need to do one more hiring. So now we met our quota of summer workers that we're going to hire. Paul thought about it, he thought about it, and he sit <clears throat> one day and he called, I can't think of the, it was Robert something, the lawyer at the time. Carly Perry. Robert, Robert the lawyer. It was a, lo a, lo a, lo a local lawyer. Oh. <clears throat> a, lo a local lawyer. He said, you know what? I got an EEOC case I want you to look into. And he came to that house that night, we sit in the den on Robert Bobby Street. And he talked to me, 
And he said, uh, he talked to Paul. He said, are you sure you want to go forward with this? Are you ready for us to file on this EEOC that they won't hire you because of who you are? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Let's, let's go forward. <laughs> so we, you know, signed the papers and everything. The next week, evidently, it got back to them what we were doing. They called me in for an interview. I went in for the interview. Did well on the interview. Everything was up. Everything was okay. But they found one loophole not to hire me. When they sent me to the for physical, they sent me through a full physical, and they found a hernia, <laughs> an inguinal hernia. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why the doctor said they couldn't hire me because I had to get the hernia <laughs> fixed. Mm -hmm. So I had to end up going back to Rosenblum's <laughs> that summer and working at the at the store. And and that was that was really a downer because like I say, Greg had did the hog log and I, I wanted to get out there and do the hog log because if Greg could do it, I figured I could work the hog log or work, you know a double shift, two double shifts or whatever, <laughs> and do it. Because I just, you know, that was just a tradition, you know, for everybody to work on the ball in, in the mill mm -hmm. or, or that. Mm -hmm. And when I didn't get it and I had to go back to, well, I had a you know, job waiting for me doing something, but I had to go back to that. That, that. that showed me then how much or how far mm -hmm. injustice goes mm -hmm. to... to you know, with, with, with people. Mm -hmm. and, see, I mean, and, and see, that's the point. It trickles Dad, down. Uh -huh. Daddy, never, <sighs> Daddy never missed that. He never would miss that. When he, he, he would, he would kind of bow, bow his head a little bit and he'd take his thumbs like this. And you know, <laughs> you know he was up to something. Something, mm -hmm. he was thinking about something. And I'm sure that's exactly what he did with Daryl. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's try this. Because he always wanted to file a suit, go to court, and get injustice. Um, and I want to say one thing. When we uh, did our testing, our uh, testing the public facilities, and we went in, when we went in to Woolworth, they removed all of the seats and the counters. And they closed it down so they didn't have to serve blacks. And my daddy sits up here and he said, that's one thing that I didn't do. I should have filed a suit mm -hmm. on Woolworth across this country. Mm -hmm. That they, If they were going to pull it down in Bogalusa, then they were going to pull it down mm -hmm. in every Woolworth mm -hmm. they had across this country. Mm -hmm and deal with it because mm -hmm. that was uh they showed us mm -hmm. that we were not going to be served mm -hmm. at Woolworth mm -hmm. and he said I just didn't I didn't have the lawyers to do that for me and that's the only thing I regret. Mm -hmm. Daryl when did you say experience at the summer at the plant? I was 77. Yeah. Okay. 77. Yeah. Yeah. You know and, that, and that's like yeah. a 10 year. That's right. That's 10 years. 10 years span. Yeah, in two generations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, let me invite you to, to offer final thoughts. And um, you've been extremely patient and very generous, so thank you all for that. If there are more you feel you would like to say, we'd, we'd love to hear it. So. Well, I'm, th I'm through. I'm <laughs> through. <laughs> well, <laughs> Just you know, I, I asked my daddy once. I said, Dad, do you think that we got an extraordinary family? And he said, no, nah, son, I think we're an ordinary family that God prepared for extraordinary times. And when I think about my dad and some of the things that he did in terms of how the Civil Rights Movement changed our family and did all that, uh, one of the things that my mom and dad were noted for long before they got into the movement was that their ability to care for the community. Uh, there are many kids uh, who are now grown and stuff uh, who 
I can tell you about uh, what daddy and mama did for them. My father and mother were taking uh, kids in the neighborhood to college, to Southern, uh, and sometimes to Gramlin, when none of us were going. But because they needed to go to college and they didn't have cars, my mother and daddy would pack, the, pack their cars and sometimes take two or three trips to get kids in Bogalusa to Southern. Uh, they had a fair. It was segregated at that time, but because we had a car, my dad would sometimes make five and six trips to Frank Lutheran Fair, so that yeah, so that so those so the <laughs> black kids in our neighborhood or wherever in the city who wanted to go to the fair could go, and they paid fifty cents or a dollar to go. But if they didn't have the money, he said, "Come on, I'll take you anyway." And so they have always been uh, people who cared in the community. And as a family, uh, we grew up where family was important. And we literally did, never did anything uh, that didn't happen with the family. You know, we never uh, stayed uh, overnight at anybody's house. Uh, when my parents went to New Orleans to buy a car, the first time they bought a car, we were staying at my grandmother's. And they came back, I guess, 10 or we were in bed. They came, woke us up, and took us home. Uh, we never stayed at other people's houses. Uh, the kids could stay with us, but we we stayed. Uh, when we did something during the summer, uh, we went crabbing as a family. We went fishing as a family. We did so much as a family. And the one standard rule that we had that was just, um, that could not be broken was that you were family and brothers and sisters don't fight. And regardless of whatever happened, if, if I spit in my brother's face, we both got whipped because we were brothers and the first thing we did was fought, not because of, well, Rob said this, I did this. The first principle was that you're family and brothers and sisters don't fight. And that has been a principle that has carried through this family uh, that has gone on for generations and generations. And one of the interesting things that has happened about that is I watched my brothers and sisters with their children and my nieces and nephews. If they get into a fight, an argument, or a disagreement, uh, and if one of them says, if my, if my nephew Greg's son says, well, Rob's son started it, you know what they tell him? You see all these adults around here? Then why didn't you come to somebody? You both were punished. And so the value of family has been just absolutely very, very important for us as a family. And during the Civil Rights Movement, uh, when, when our lives changed, as Barbara alluded to, you know, when we were growing up, we, every night we sat down and had dinner together. And we had to talk about what, what happened to us at school. Uh, what, what, you know, on Sundays, we had family prayer together. We did all these things. And then all of a sudden, the Civil Rights Movement comes in, and we are no longer acting as a family. While we were still there and, and doing family things, we, you know, uh, as much as we could. <coughs> but... One of the things that the reason we were in the movement is not because, well, not maybe because we wanted to, but because our parents were in it, we were automatically in it. Because whatever they did, we did. And whatever uh, <coughs> they did, they included us. So when they got in the movement, we knew we were in it. Uh, that wasn't a question of do you want to be in the movement. Uh, we just automatically knew. Uh, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, did you ever talk to Greg and Pino about the integrated the school? He said, no, I just signed them up. And I asked him, I said, did that is, he said, no. I said, did you want to do it? He said, it wasn't a question of wanting. You know, we were in the Hicks, we were in the movement, and we did it. And I think the miraculous thing about all of this is that after the movement, uh, after all that we've cut, all that we've been through, the many stress, the many sleepless nights, the fear, the psychological effect, uh, the doom without, uh, the attacks, is that we came back together that we were allowed to come back together and be a family again. And that we came out of this, as so many other uh, black families in small towns and <coughs> cities, we came out of this saying that we still have our minds. And when you think about sometimes the things that black people have gone through since they've been in this country, and if you were to concentrate it long enough, concentrate it on it long enough, you would probably just go insane. But we've been blessed as a family come back out of all of this same healthy and still a family. I want to thank y'all so much. It's been a 
long evenings, especially thank you for your patience <laughs> and, and your generosity. Thank you all. It was a real honor to be with you. Thank you. Oh, we thank you. Thank you. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.